So this lecture is going to cover the end of the drugs, alcohol, and the brain lecture that we didn't get to finish in class on Friday. Uh, we left off, we were talking about alcohol, and we had gone through the definition of binge drinking, uh, which is four drinks in a setting for a woman and five drinks in a setting for a man. And the short-term effects of alcohol in the brain, uh, we talked about dopamine, which again is the feel-good neurotransmitter. Dopamine is released, uh, but only when the blood alcohol content is rising. So only as you're getting more intoxicated does, does dopamine get released. Uh, this is part of the reason why people will sometimes drink too much. Um, people uh, want to continue to feel good, and you only uh, continue to feel good as you're getting more intoxicated. Uh, combined with the fact that inhibitions uh, are decreased, um, which also leads to uh, riskier decisions. We talked that alcohol affects serotonin. Serotonin affects mood uh, as well as uh, sleep. Uh, we talked about GABA. Uh, GABA is the primary inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain. Uh, and it also uh, affects glutamate, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter. Uh, it affects glutamate uh, as it's broken down, uh, and that's where it becomes a stimulant uh, as, you, uh, as you're processing it. Uh, we left off, we were about to start talking about the long-term effects of alcohol. Uh, one uh, impact, uh, especially of uh, heavy drinking, is uh, in a problem with being able to uh, form new memories. So people who are heavy drinkers for a long time uh, can suffer from something called Korsakoff syndrome. Korsakoff syndrome is a form of uh, anterograde amnesia where it becomes very difficult to form new memories. Uh, not to the severity uh, that we saw with Clive Weering on the video in class, but again, fairly significant. This will affect people even when they're not actively intoxicated. Uh, now, fortunately, Korsakoff syndrome uh, can be reversed if the person sobers up and is a bit, uh, able to stay off of alcohol uh, for a prolonged period of time. Now, you won't get memories back uh, that hadn't formed, because that's not how memory works. Remember our discussions of memory from Chapter 8. But you uh, will be able to start making new memories again. Uh, it also has impacts on attention. Uh, the ability to focus uh, is compromised in long-term he long heavy drinkers. Uh, long-term effects of alcohol also include difficulty with problem solving. Uh, people who are long-term, uh, especially heavy drinkers, um, are um, struggle to be able to create novel solutions to problems. They often get stuck in uh, kind of the same pattern of behavior, um, which can lead to their uh, making it challenging for them to see alternative solutions beyond uh, using alcohol in heavy doses. Uh, I mentioned when we were talking about uh, alcohol earlier that one of the impacts can be in a reduced ability to perceive emotions. So people will tend to interpret emotions uh, inconsistently with how other people would. So this is one of the reasons why um, you know in, there are uh, you get angry drunks. Um, so people who will misinterpret neutral uh, situations as um, attacks and people uh, are not able to judge the kind of emotion behind what's going on uh, around them. And then there are all the physical issues with long-term heavy alcohol use. Uh, damage to the liver um, is probably the most well-known symptom, but it can also impact uh, the heart uh, as well as decreased immune system functioning. Um, so you end up uh, more likely to get sick, uh, as well as having other um, health complications. So moving on, the next class of drugs we're going to talk about is stimulants. So stimulants are essentially the opposite of depressants, where depressants will slow down the central nervous system, the stimulants speed it up. They essentially turn on the fight or flight response. Uh, and so one of the reasons why people like them is we get this burst of energy, uh, you feel invincible, uh, and that is, is a direct correlate to the uh, activation of your fight or flight response. Now we'll talk more specifically about the fight or flight response later in the course uh, and all the biological mechanisms and things like that. But the, the way the stimulants uh, as a class work in the brain 
are um, they will bond with uh, glutamate primarily. Uh, glutamate is the, like we just talked about with alcohol, the primary excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain. Uh, so it speeds up uh, firing. It uh, makes the uh, action potentials more likely to happen. Stimulants also affect dopamine, so again, the, the feel-good chemical. Uh, stimulants will activate epinephrine and norepinephrine. Epinephrine is adrenaline and norepinephrine is noradrenaline. Epinephrine or adrenaline is the physical uh, aspects of the fight or flight response, whereas norepinephrine is the kind of mental effects of the fight or flight response. And stimulants also affect serotonin, uh, again, uh, making you uh, having effects on mood and sleep. Now, because you're stimulating the fight or flight response, uh, if you use stimulants in high doses, you run the risk of overwhelming the system. And in high doses, stimulants can cause seizures, right? Which makes sense in terms of if you're you're increasing the the firing of all your brain cells, uh, all the neurons, then you uh, run the risk of kind of setting off this cascading reaction where the uh, the electrical activity in the brain becomes uncontrolled. Uh, and it can actually uh, result in death. Uh, your heart can give out uh, if it's pushed too far. Common stimulants include things uh, like nicotine, uh, cocaine, crack, amphetamines, meth, uh, anything that would be considered uppers. And it's important to realize that includes things like Ritalin and Adderall. Now, it might seem counterintuitive to prescribe stimulants to someone with ADHD, uh, especially if you think of someone who has the hyperactive or impulsive subtype of ADHD. You would think you'd want to give them drugs that would calm them down, not drugs that would kind of speed up their nervous system. Uh, what we find, though, is that for people with ADHD, uh, their need for stimulation is generally quite a bit higher than the kind of average person. So in a sense, by giving them uppers, by giving them stimulants, you are kind of balancing out the, the need for stimulation, uh, which lets them uh, be able to apply their focus where they want. Um, so they can pay attention in school or at work uh, or wherever else the situation demands it. Okay, the next section of drugs that I want to talk about are hallucinogens. Uh, hallucinogens are also known as psychedelic drugs. These are drugs that uh, change the way you perceive the world around you. So hallucinogens can affect any of your senses. Uh, so there are visual hallucinations, auditory hallucinations. You can have gustatory hallucinations, which is your sense of taste olfactory hallucinations, which is your sense of smell, and also tactile uh, hallucinations, which is your sense of touch. Um, most of these hallucinogens work through uh, the neurotransmitter serotonin. Common hallucinogens include things like LSD or acid, uh, ketamine, special K, um, mescaline, um, psilocybin, so PCP, uh, magic mushrooms, um, ecstasy is a hallucinogen, so there are all kinds of different hallucinogens uh, out there on the market. Uh, one of the challenging things about hallucinogens is even among people who use them regularly, the effects are really difficult to predict. So you're not going to be able to predict uh, when and where a bad trip is going to happen. Another risk with hallucinogens is you run the possibility of having flashbacks. So flashbacks are times where you will uh, essentially go back into the hallucinogenic state. You will re-experience hallucinations that you had in the past, uh, even when you're not currently intoxicated. So the last concept I want to talk about uh, in terms of drugs is addiction. The common definition of addiction is repetitive, compulsive use of a substance despite negative consequences to the user. So for someone to be addicted, they have to use a substance consistently, okay, so you have to use it uh, on an ongoing basis. Uh, the use has to be compulsive, meaning that you can't do without it, okay, that you, you'd use the drug kind of whether you want to or not.
and the use has to continue uh, in spite of there being negative consequences. So if there are no negative consequences to your use, uh, by this definition you wouldn't have uh, an addiction. So this is a pretty controversial uh, description because there are people for whom they can use substances in large qu quantities uh, and but not be necessarily uh, experiencing negative consequences, at least in the short term. Um, you may have heard of the terms like functional alcoholic uh, to describe people who are able to go about their kind of regular day, perform well at their jobs, perform well uh, in school, uh, have you know a good social life, but they're also drinking uh, really heavily. Uh, now, part of the problem with this definition is deciding, you know, what counts as a negative consequence. Is increased, increased risk of liver damage uh, a negative consequence, or is it only a negative consequence once liver damage actually sets in? Uh, if you um, lose a job because of your uh, alcohol use or other drug use, um, is that negative if it was a job you didn't like anyway and you're able to get a better one afterward? Um, so, you know, the negative consequences uh, is a trickier component than, than we might think. Now, when it comes to um, actually making a kind of medical diagnosis, uh, Addiction is actually not uh, the technical term for, for what would show up in somebody's medical chart, uh, either from a medical doctor or a psychologist or uh, alcohol and drug counselor or anything like that. The, the official disorder uh, is called substance use disorder. Uh, so the word addiction uh, is not used in the DSM. The DSM is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, which is a giant catalog of all the different psychological um, uh, illnesses that someone can have. So in terms of what's going on uh, in, the, in terms of the biology of addiction, um, there is a heavy genetic influence. So uh, alcoholism and other drug use tends to run in families. Um, so you are at increased risk of developing your own uh, addictive behaviors, your own substance use disorder, uh, if you have relatives who uh, also have that issue. Um, and in particular, uh, it seems to be that genes that regulate dopamine levels in the brain uh, play a particular role in how uh, prone to addiction an individual is. So if you have uh, genes that make you more sensitive to dopamine, um, you have a higher likelihood of ending up uh, in a uh, addictive relationship with substances. Now this makes sense in that if you get kind of a, a bigger rush or a bigger positive feeling after using, uh, you'd be more likely to keep using and you'd be more likely to persist in your use in the face of negative consequences. Now, uh, we're not at the point where we can run a genetic test for people to see kind of what your risk of becoming addicted to substances is. Um, it's, it's not as straightforward as that. Lots of people will have this gene or these genes and will never have a problem with substances in their life. But we do know that there is a strong genetic component. What's going on in the actual brain? Uh, dopamine it controls what's called the reward pathway in the brain. The reward pathway in the brain is a series of structures that lead to the decision to uh, increase frequency of specific behaviors. Essentially, it's the system that rewards your brain with uh, dopamine when you do something that should be repeated. Now, when we talked about uh, the brain in chapter four, uh, we mentioned a little bit about brain plasticity. Okay, so the brain uh, is an ever-changing organ. So uh, when we talked about the, the activity at the synapse, so how uh, one neuron can communicates with the next. Um, we talked about that the amount of neurotransmitter that gets released across the synapse uh, is not always constant. 
Okay, so for example, if you are artificially uh, increasing the amount of dopamine released in your brain, uh, your brain tries to keep things in a very kind of narrow band of functioning called homeostasis. So um, if you are dumping a bunch of excess dopamine in, uh, your brain will try to regulate itself to compensate for the fact that you're getting these extra doses of dopamine. The way it will do that is it will actually start producing less dopamine by itself. Okay, so the kind of overall level of dopamine uh, kind of goes back to that, that pre-drug using level. So this is why we build what's called tolerance. So tolerance is the, the need for increasing levels of a drug to achieve the same level of intoxication. Um, as you be continue to use substances, uh, you will find that you need to um, increase the dosage uh, in order to get the same result. Now, this this is not just kind of the illicit or illegal street drugs. Uh, the same thing happens with caffeine. The same thing can happen uh, with antidepressants or any other drug uh, that you're taking. You may periodically have to up your dose to compensate for the fact that your body um, a becomes better at processing it, but B will produce less of it on its own. So the the brain's plasticity uh, will lead to increasing uh, increasingly high doses of the drug needed, which of course increases the risk of overdose. Uh, the other side, uh, or the other component of uh, brain plasticity that plays a role in addiction is something called reward deficiency syndrome. So when your brain has stopped producing uh, the amount of dopamine that it normally, normally does, it's become dependent on the external source of dopamine. So if you were to suddenly stop using your drug, it will take your brain a while to readjust and compensate for the lack of uh, external sources. And so in the meantime, uh, you're going to struggle to produce enough dopamine to actually get rewards uh, from things that would have used to provide it. So the dopamine re release that we get uh, from having a little chocolate or the dopamine re release we get from uh, a kiss from our romantic partner um, these will no longer have kind of a measurable impact. Uh, things won't feel good anymore, which is one of the reasons why it's so hard for people to stop using substances when they're addicted. Uh, if you think about it, we're, we're asking people to give up the only substances that actually physiologically allow them to feel pleasure. Um, you know, we're asking people to go through a period of sometimes months where nothing feels good. So you can see where that's a, a tough thing for people to sign up for. And uh, if you don't help that person build uh, additional coping strategies, ways to manage uh, feeling down in the dumps or ways to handle um, setbacks when they're trying to quit, uh, it's very common for people to return to, to their usage patterns or relapse into usage patterns um, as a way to just try to get themselves to feel right. Uh, now, one additional area of the brain I want to talk about is the prefrontal cortex. Remember that the prefrontal cortex uh, plays a primary role in decision making, in the uh, ability to plan out uh, future activities and use hypothetical scenarios, things like that. So parts of the uh, prefrontal cortex are very important for both inhibiting uh, impulsive activities by being able to think of alternative solutions or how this will affect long-term goals, uh, as well as the ability to create alternative solutions. Uh, and there's uh, evidence um, from, from recent research uh, that uh, there are structural changes in the uh, prefrontal cortex uh, that have to do with long-term potentiation, which again is the um, kind of repeated pairing of different neurons. So you're kind of creating a, uh, a, a common set of neurons that fire together. Uh, and depending where this long-term potentiation occurs, you can have uh, effects that either will make people uh, make it more difficult for people to cre think of alternative ways to solve problems or have a lot of difficulty with impulse control uh, or potentially both.
So you can see how there are diverse effects uh, on the brain and why uh, addiction can be a real challenging uh, issue to overcome. Uh, I also want to touch on the role of mental health issues in addiction. Um, mental health concerns, depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, uh, all kinds of different uh, mental health issues are highly comorbid with substance use. Comorbid just means that both, uh, both disorders uh, happen at the same time. So if you have uh, substance use disorder comorbid with major depressive disorder it just means you meet criteria for both disorders uh, simultaneously um, people now it's it's not clear um, the extent to which uh, one causes the other or if they're mutually influencing what I mean is uh, for some people uh, they will have a mental health issue whether it's uh, post-traumatic stress disorder major depressive disorder something like that and they will turn to substances to help manage their mood or to help uh, kind of numb themselves away from emotional pain uh, so in that case, the uh, mental health disorder seems to be driving the creation of the substance abuse. There's also, uh, for some people, uh, ongoing substance abuse uh, will lead to mental health problems uh, in terms of this can happen multiple ways, either through um, changing the uh, equilibrium points for different neurotransmitters. Uh, we talked about several different classes of drugs that affect serotonin, for example, and uh, changes in serotonin levels uh, are connected to both anxiety disorders as well as depressive disorders. So it may be the ongoing exposure to uh, drugs that creates conditions uh, that lead to mental health disorders. So that's all I wanted to cover uh, for, for this part of the class at least. If you have found the discussion of uh, drugs, uh, alcohol, brain issues, addiction, if this is all interesting to you, um, I would highly recommend you consider taking our uh, psychology course, uh, Psychopharmacology, which is Psych 214. Uh, Hank Gorman teaches that class and he talks about how all different drugs uh, affect the brain. Uh, so both street drugs and kind of legal medicinal drugs uh, and uh, we'll talk in much more detail about how that works in terms of physiology but also in terms of uh, addiction uh, and um, kind of those different models for explaining it. Uh, Hank also teaches a uh, capstone course uh, Psych 451 called Understanding and Treating Addiction uh, so uh, which includes a lot of uh, uh, participation from local um, law enforcement and probation officers as well as uh, local um, uh, local addiction counselors and treatment centers. So that wraps up what uh, the lecture that we didn't get to finish. Uh, if you have questions about this material, uh, feel free to shoot me an email.